Hi, this is Carsten from UFO Denmark. We are so lucky to have Billy Carson on the show today. Billy, can you please introduce yourself? Sure. First of all, thanks for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Billy Carson. I am the founder of ForbiddenKnowledge.com and Forbidden Knowledge TV. That's with the number four. It's a streaming TV network available on Apple TV, Roku, and Amazon Fire TV. Uh, I am also a best-selling author of the Compendium of the Emerald Tablets, which is a book on ancient civilizations about advanced beings that came down to earth and interacted and engaged mankind, brought knowledge and wisdom to man, and also did genetic modifications and also other esoteric teachings, including the origins of the mystery schools. Uh, I do have a, a certificate in applied neuroscience from MIT and also a certificate in ancient civilizations from Harvard University. And uh, I'm also a, a host on many TV shows. I'm currently on shows that are air on the Travel Channel, the History Channel, the Science Channel, and the Discovery Channel. I'm an expert host on ancient civilizations on Gaia TV, as well as Deep Space on Gaia. Season three is out on both of those um, shows. And of course, I'm also the host of my own show, Forbidden Knowledge with Billy Carson on Forbidden Knowledge TV. And I've also been featured on Dame Dash Studios TV as well. And today I'm gonna to talk about how the ancient past and these ancient Anunnaki slash Atlantean beings came from outer space in ships and UFOs and engaged mankind. So I'm gonna go into some of the oldest texts that we know of, not the absolute oldest, but some of the oldest. And these texts are gonna pretty much lay out some incredible information about the origins of our solar system uh, and even the genetic modification of what I think used to be our cousin on this planet to create the Homo sapien sapien, okay? So I'm gonna share my screen now. I'm gonna go into this um, little presentation here. Let's go in here now and have a peek. Okay. This is my book, by the way, Compendium of the Animal Tablets, A Beginner's Guide. Again, it's been a bestseller for 17 months straight on Amazon. This is some of the shows that I've been in, many documentaries and shows over the years. Uh, this is me inside of the Great Pyramid. Uh, so I start off usually with a couple of photos of me traveling around the world. I'm a field researcher. I actually get out in the field. Uh, and the reason for me why that's important is because when you talk about these kind of controversial or gray area topics, and you're trying to present information to people to get them to raise a question mark in their head that they want to go maybe research it or investigate it more, I believe it's a little bit more credible when you've actually gone out and done the work yourself. So I like to go out in the field. And so here I am at Giza inside of the Great Pyramid. I'm actually inside the King's Chamber inside the Great Pyramid here. Um, and it's really incredible because the King's Chamber, if you look at the actual location, the geographic coordinate for the King's Chamber, it matches the exact numbers or digits for the speed of light in meters per second. And even though people will say, well, meters didn't exist until the late 1900s, actually not. If you look into the Proto-Sumerian cuneiform text, you discover that the ancient Sumerians, before Sumeria existed in Iraq, Proto-Egyptian, I mean, Proto-Sumerian texts were discovered in Mesoamerica, uh, in South America, that actually depict a formulated metric system. So the metric system existed a very, very long time ago, thousands of years ago. There's also technology, uh, inside of the Great Pyramid, well, not inside the Great Pyramid, but the, the, the Great Pyramid is made of a specific type of technology. In other words, the way they constructed it is a gigantic stone computer. Inside the Great Pyramid, there are different areas and rooms that lead us to believe that they were technologically created, including markers for electric symbols and so forth, behind little tiny doors that they had to send a remote control car into. But one of the most incredible places that I visited was the Temple of Abydos. And at the Temple of Abydos, there's actual drawings or depictions in the hieroglyphs of advanced technology like helicopters, tanks, planes, submarines, and everything else. It's really intriguing. Mainstream archaeology will tell you that, oh, this happened by accident because these glyphs were rewritten and it just happened to look like that. When you go and you get an actual homegrown archaeologist like I did and a homegrown uh, guide, 
they will tell you that that is a pitch that they're told to give to the general population, to the tourists. But the truth is, nobody has ever gone up there and re-etched these hieroglyphs, and we don't know how uh, they, you know, they had knowledge of this technology, but this wasn't the only place. The Temple of Abydos is not the only place that shows this. He said, so the proof that this isn't rewritten is because there's other areas where glyphs of Gen have never been touched within hand's reach that also depict these same exact amazing technological designs. Here I am at the top of Ali and Tatumbo. A lot of the stones at the top of this uh, mountaintop fortress were brought over from 400 miles away. Some of the stones are super massive. I'm standing in like a courtyard area at the top where some of the smaller stones, but it's an incredible place. And for some of those stones weighing uh, 10 and 15 tons to be brought from 400 miles from the top of another mountain, uh, according to the guide that I was with, the stones floated into place. So it's really amazing stuff. This is why I like to get out in the field. This is a video, a, a short snap I took of Machu Picchu. Again, this entire mountainside of Machu Picchu is completely landscaped. In other words, they um, terraformed it. Uh, it's not naturally just in the shapes that are there. It's terraformed and then there's structures built on top. It's an incredible place. Here I am at Sexo Oman with uh, my guide, another homegrown guide uh, down in Peru. The stones behind me, I'm six foot four to give you an idea. And you can see that the stone behind me is at least a foot taller than me. That's one stone probably can weigh, who knows how many thousands of pounds or tons. Uh, but behind these stones, my guide told me there's still hidden gold. Hidden gold behind these stones. This is why the military guards this location all the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And here I am again here um, in uh, Cambodia. I hiked 37 miles th through the jungle of Cambodia, went to all the ancient temples. And here you can see one of the temples that I came across at Angkor Wat, uh, really at Tao Prom, which is near Angkor Wat, out in the, out in the jungle. Uh, there's depictions of actual dinosaurs etched into these ancient temples. When the dinosaurs have meat on their bones, so these people knew what dinosaurs looked like, which means they had to have been alive at the time that people were alive. And here I am at a great ancient Atlantean dig site in Akrotiri, Greece, where you can clearly see this dig site. There's evidence of advanced technology at this site. Um, it's literally, uh, you know, there's gigantic stones that are a few meters thick that have tiny pinholes drilled in one side and go all the way through to the other side. And then you also have two-story buildings with flushing toilets on the second floor. And not just flushing toilets, but toilets that actually have the capability of sucking out any of the smell from going inside the apartment and sucking it outside and releasing it outside. We need that today. So, <laughs> But there's so much advanced technology at this site. Things that look like PVC piping and plumbing things that shouldn't have existed back then is here. And this, uh, this advanced civilization was covered over by volcanic ash. Now here I am at Teotihuacan, Mexico, uh, and I'm standing on top of the Pyramid of the Moon, and behind me is the Pyramid of the Sun. So again, just a few images showing you that I've been around the world, I've been to these places, I've visited them in person, um, you know, and uh, I've had a lot of help from this team here a lot of this team here have helped me really crack a lot of codes to the ancient civilizations, ancient history, the origins of a lot of UFOs, the fact that some of these UFOs could be tied to ancient civilizations. Uh, and I really want to thank every single one of them because that without their work, a lot of my work wouldn't, be, wouldn't even be possible. So what I've discovered in my research is that a lot of these beings always point to the Pleiadian star system. They point to the Pleiades as a point of origin, as if that's where everything originated or started. So I started researching the Pleiadian uh, star system and realized it wasn't just seven stars. We, from our perspective on Earth, it appears to be seven stars, but the incredible thing is there's literally millions of stars in that region of space, in that sector, and there's probably tens of millions of planets and a lot of inhabited planets with advanced civilizations and life. The Aborigines, uh, and I've met with the Aboriginal elders in person. There's a new, a new documentary I'm working on called The Mystery of the Gosford Glyphs. These Aboriginal uh, people claim to have been brought 
here to earth from the Pleiades. They were seated here by Pleiadians and they claim to be the very first people on earth uh, during this current era. So there's a lot of history here with the Pleiades. I also collect um, artifacts, artifacts that are original and also some that are replications of the actual original to scale. And what I found is in 70% of these artifacts, they always depict the Pleiadian star system. It's really, really amazing that they do that. Uh, and there's got to be a reason why. Now, when you dig deeper into a lot of these ancient scrolls, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the Mahabharata, Bhagavad Gita, and the, the Puranas, you start to discover that there was an ancient galactic war between advanced civilizations in this region of space. This war was between people from different planets. And this one particular weapon started to be used, a Brahma weapon, which literally had the capability of exploding planets. Well, this happened. And this Death Star, so to speak, started blowing up planets and the debris was crashing into other planets where people were living and destroying entire planets and destroying entire solar systems. Uh, as you can imagine, that size, planetary sized debris floating through your solar system, crashing into everything, it would rain havoc. So then we have the beginnings of space refugees, people fleeing these planets, these destroyed planets in that region of space with all that debris floating around, going out to the Orion, going out to El Debron, going out to um, Sirius, A, B, and C, uh, you know, various star systems, Zeta Reticulus, going out to these other star systems, the, and also the Epsilon Bos, this constellation as well, and repopulating those regions of space. So this happened in multi-millions of years ago. It's the Galactic War. So I'm actually working on a movie about this now called Chronicles of the Anunnaki. And in there, my, my first scene starts off with a galactic war in the Pleiades. Now, uh, a lot of the information about these ancient wars and the fact that they existed and what the ancients had to say about them can be found in several books. You got Burnham's Celestial Handbook, Star Names, Their Lore and Meaning, Star Lore of All Ages, Star Tales, The Age of Fable, The Greek Myths, the Reader's Encyclopedia, American Heritage Dictionary, Fundamentals of Physics. So I like to back up a lot of what I talk about with sources and facts so that people don't think I'm just making things up off the top of my head. These are the star systems that they fled to. So you can clearly see here that these beings had star, uh, they had interplanetary starships. These interplanetary, interplanetary starships had the capability of going from one star to another. Now that's incredible. Sirius and Orion's belt and Aldebaran, these are multiples of light years away from each other, which means they must have had advanced technology and they must have had maybe potentially warp technology, EM drive type technology where you use microwaves to create thrust. Um, they definitely had hyper, either maybe hyperdimensional. They had the ability to move from star to star because if they didn't, it would take literally millions of years for them to inhabit uh, these new regions of space, and it didn't. They got there rather quickly, okay? We also talk about in the Enuma Elish, which I'm gonna talk about today a little bit, this one planet that orbits a brown dwarf uh, star, which has now been officially discovered in our solar system, orbiting our sun every 4,200 years is the time frame now given, I guess the, the orbit has modified itself over time. And this brown dwarf, along with several other small satellites, or orbit this brown dwarf star and go through our, our solar system. And it's now science fact, not fiction. They've actually discovered it. It's not, a, it's not a mystery anymore. They call it Planet Nine in the science books. So we're going to talk briefly about the Enuma Elish and the seven tablets of creation. Uh, because in this Enuma Elish, which is these ancient cuneiform tablets, it's going to talk about these beings and the fact that they did not originate on this planet, okay? This is what the Enuma Elish and the Seven Tablets of the Creation look like. These are cuneiform tablets discovered in Iraq. They're now on display at the museum, at the British Museum. So the Enuma Elish uh, is also known in Akkadian cuneiform, spelled Enuma Elis. It's the Babylonian creation myth, and it was recovered by Austin Henry Laird in 1849, in the ruined library of Ashurbanipal at Nineveh, which is Moscow, Iraq. 
uh, and published by George Smith in 1876. Now I want to stop there for one second. A lot of people know Zachariah Sitchin. I have so much respect for that man because he dedicated his life to researching these topics and bringing out books that helped us open up our minds and ask a lot of questions. A huge myth went around the internet years ago that Zachariah Sitchin was the only person that could read these tablets and he made everything up. Well, that's false because if you look here, it was recovered by Austin Henry Layard in 1876 and it was deciphered by George Smith, published by George Smith. George Smith actually um, translated these tablets. 1876, we'll go into that a little bit deeper. I want you to understand this here. The main source of uh, Zachariah Sitchin's work and talking about these Anunnaki Atlanteans and the ships and everything that they flew was going back to this, uh, this, this here. So we're talking about something very, very ancient, guys. Nothing that Zachariah Sitchin himself did all by himself. That's, that's a fable. And the reason why they did that, they tried to discredit him and make it look like he was a psychopathic uh, idiot and he didn't know what he was talking about and he made this story up to get rich. False, okay? The Enuma Elish is about a thousand lines uh, and it's recorded in old Babylonian on seven clay tablets, each holding between 115 and 170 lines of Sumero, Sumero Akkadian cuneiform script. Most of the tablet five had never been recovered until recently and tablet five was discovered at the Sumalaya Museum in Iraq. Iraq truly is the birthplace of civilization as we know it. The Anunnaki, uh, when they came here, that was their initial home base before the Great Flood. Home, uh, civilization did not start in Africa. I, I hate to break that to a lot of people, but it, it just didn't. Uh, what it, it is what it is. It didn't start in Africa. It restarted in Africa after the Great Flood, but it didn't start in Africa originally when the Anunnaki got here. The epic is one of the most important sources of, of understanding the Babylonian worldview centered on the supremacy of Marduk and the creation of humankind for the service of the gods. Its primary original purpose, however, is not, is not an exhibition of theology or theology, but an elevation of Marduk, the chief god of Babylon, above other Mesopotamian gods. So let me just break that down. This Marduk character who's also written about in the modern, modern day Bible, you can find his name in the modern day Bible. You can find his name in the Torah. You can find his name in the uh, Egyptian Book of the Dead. His name is Marduk, AKA, also known as Amen Ra. Amen Ra, the great Amen. That's who this is. Now, Amen Ra had a lot of competition with his relatives, his Anunnaki or Atlantean relatives that were around the planet ruling different groups of humans in different areas of the planet as they mined the planet for resources. Amen Ra became very jealous of his other relatives and he wanted to be all these relatives of his, they were all masquerading as gods on this planet. They literally masqueraded as gods, knowing that, for example, they weren't the true all creator God, but that they were masquerading and because they called, they said to themselves, or they had a conversation at one point, they said, when the creator of all finds out what we did here, we're going to have to pay for this. So they actually had knowledge that there was something above them. But while they were here, they masqueraded to human beings as gods, a man or Marduk, Marduk, he said, you know what? I don't want these people worshiping my, my relatives anymore. I want to be the one and only true God. So I'm going to make them all worship me. So he's the one that ushered in monotheism. He did it through Akhenaten. Okay. After the great flood, he did it through Akhenaten. And he had Akhenaten go around and start defacing all the other gods, stripping them, their, ripping off their faces, ripping off their noses, like etching them out of all the hieroglyphs. And that's why Akhenaten was kicked out of Egypt because this guy was erasing all the history and then they killed his son, Tutankhamun, okay? When you hear the word of God during this lecture, keep in mind that I'm referring to, I'm not referencing the creator of the universe, I'm referencing the Anunnaki beings that masqueraded as gods with a lowercase g and were worshiped not only by Sumerians, but by many civilizations that they themselves had kickstarted, okay? That's very important to understand. This is tablet number five, by the way, that was discovered in the Sulaymaniyya Museum in Iraq. So let's go into some of the translation real quick and, and who translated these tablets. George Smith in 1840 to 1876 was an English Assyriologist, apprentice engraver, but self-taught in cuneiform in the corridors of the British Museum. Eventually, he was hired by Sir Henry Rawlinson, which was a prominent archeologist Smith achieved worldwide attention when he discovered an account of the flood with obvious biblical parallels in 1872. 
and related to the Chaldean account of the deluge. This book expands on the previous work and is and present and sorry and presents numerous translations of tablets, including the first print uh, appearance of the Epic of Gilgamesh. So this guy was an expert, obviously, on uh, translating Sumerian cuneiform tablets. He did this before Zechariah Sitchin was even born. Okay, so that just clears everything up right there. E. A. Spicer in 1926. E. A. Spicer won a Guggenheim Fellowship to study remains of the ancient Mitanni and Hurons in North Mesopotamia. While there in 1927, he discovered the Tuepe Guara, one of the world's earliest cradles of civilization. And in 1928, he was appointed assistant professor of Semitics at the University of Pennsylvania and the full professor in 1831. He was field director of the joint excavation of the American Schools of Oriental Research in the University Museum from 1930 to 1932 and 1936 to 1937, undertaking excavations at Tepe Guara and Tel Bila. He also translated the Hurrian legal text found at Nuzi. After the war, he returned to the University of Pennsylvania, where he was chairman of the Department of Oriental Studies from 1947 until his death in 1965. He was also appointed Ellis Professor of Hebrew Semitic Languages and Literatures in 1954. He translated and wrote extensive commentary for the volume of Genesis in the Ankara Bible series and was the editors in the Torah in the New Jewish Publication Society of America version and the Old Testament. A noted student of his, uh, Moshe Greenberg, became an Israel Prize Lorette in Bible studies. E.A. Spizer had also become an expert in deciphering cuneiform tablets. I'm trying to establish a record here, a track record of the fact that these tablets are real. Other people other than Zachariah Sitchin had already translated these before he even was able to grow up and do it himself. And uh, Zachariah Sitchin, truth be told, didn't really translate the tablets. He took existing translations and then he matched them up with other translations from other scriptures and texts around the world and he painted a picture as to what he thought happened in the ancient past. Okay, very important to understand. And I can keep going on. Leonard William King also was a decipher of the uh, translator of the um, of the Sumerian tablets, and of course the Enuma Elish, and some of his works, the First Steps in the Syrian, a book for beginners, being a series of historical, mythological, religious, magical, and expiratory other texts printed in cuneiform characters with interlinear transliteration and translation, and a sketch of Assyrian grammar, sign list, and vocabulary. I don't want to beat it at horse, but I want you guys to understand. For the people that are going to be doubting that these Sumerian tablets talk about Anunnaki and Atlanteans and beings coming from space, I'm establishing a track record here that long before anybody in what we call our modern time came up with these books and ideas, this information had long since been translated. Okay, and when you we're talking about people etching into stone, when people etch into stone, they're not just wasting time. They're not making up stories off the top of their head. That takes time. Using a stylus and, and wet clay takes time and baking it and everything else. And they also did it that way so it can last, it can stand the test of time. They had a serious story to tell us about the ancient past. And that story is linked directly to the current modern day UFOs that we see right now. You can find these tablets and so on at the British Museum. Here's the library of Asher Bonapal, okay, in London. Also, if you ever want to find out what some of these cuneiform tablets say, you don't have to look for uh, an expert. You can do it yourself. You can go to the uh, you can go to the UCLA CVLI cuneiform cuneiform digital library. You can grab a virtual stone off the shelf and drop it into a translator, and you can read what's on the stones yourself. You don't need to leave it up to me or anybody else you can find out the exact information that's directly on these stones. And you'll find out that we all have pretty much the same story, pretty close. That's what you're going to find out when you read them. Could it be that they weren't from the Bureau, that they were from the Orion? Could it be that they were from Sirius B and so forth and so on? Yeah, but I actually tend to feel now throughout all my research that these beings didn't just hail from one planet or one star system, that they hail from multiple star systems, which is why the Great Pyramid actually points to multiple star systems through the shafts. Those are communications, okay? I'm gonna play this very short video here from Inger, uh, Irving Finkel at the British Museum. 
on the cuneiform tablets. Which is a Semitic tongue related to the modern languages of Hebrew and Arabic and Aramaic. The writing system which Cyrus's officials used was the traditional cuneiform script which had been invented in ancient Iraq well before 3000 BC. It is written by pressing a stylus, something a bit like a chopstick, into the surface of the clay which is nearly dry and the signs which convey the sound of the language consist of different arrangements of these strokes. They're written one by one and the reader has to join them up and the sound emerges from the clay. This is the line that says, I am Kurash, Shar Kishati, king of the world, the great king, king of Babylon, and so it goes on. So we're going to write Kurash. So the first sign, Ku, has a big vertical, two small horizontals, one bigger horizontal, a little vertical, and another horizontal, like a box. This is Ku. Then Ra, we have three strong horizontals to begin, one big one next to it, and then one little vertical wedge, and one bigger vertical wedge. Ku, Ra. Now we do Ash, which is three long horizontals, Komsa, and then a vertical in the middle. So we can read this, Ku, Ra, Ash the name of Cyrus. I want you guys to understand that we are all well-versed now, meaning scholars, in these tablets. And, that, and that I have to beat a dead horse at it because it's so important to understand that the information in here is talking about people coming from outer space and UFOs. And so if there's a doubt in your mind that this text says that because of uh, false information or propaganda about one person, that can distort your reality or your understanding. So I had to clear, make sure I clear that up uh, in this presentation. This is the Torah, or also known as the law of the law of God, is what that really translates to. Uh, and in here is where a lot of these other characters that are talked about in Sumerian tablets made their way. You see the biblical copies and the Torah, uh, Jewish Torah, they all got their information from the Sumerian tablets. You can even go to the ancient Jewish history library and you can find that the names in the Sumerian tablets which predate the Torah and the Bible by thousands of years they're in Sumerian cuneiform tablets already Marduk for example his name is all over the Jewish history inside the Jewish library uh, he's in the Torah he's in the modern day Bible these names are not mysterious names that are just fabricated out of thin air these advanced beings existed and they're they're recorded in, in print so let's take a quick look at this um, interesting photo here. This is the, um, the Hubble Sky Book, okay? And the Hubble Sky Book, you're looking at two trillion uh, galaxies. Forget about two trillion stars. You're looking at two trillion galaxies in the Sky Book. So where do we come from? You're going to be interested to find out that we all are aliens uh, in this entire solar system. Uh, right now you say, okay, well, our sun's out here in this outer ring and uh, we're orbiting the galactic equator. And that's all true. That's all true. But let's really have a deeper look to this. Right now, this is what we say our inner solar system is all about. Gas giants. Now, 
of the outermost planets that we know of. So that kind of covers our solar system. Now, that's what we've been taught. These planets missing from there, obviously, like Ceres and a few others, some smaller planets. But it's important to understand that our solar system is planted here in the Milky Way galaxy. We are actually part of something different called the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy. And the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy is still merging with the uh, Milky Way. The Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy actually collided with the Milky Way, and we're still in the process of, of, go of gobbling it up. It's a much smaller galaxy. And right at the point of the gobble where the two galaxies intersect, scientists discovered that our solar system, where we are exactly located, was dropped in here and absorbed in by the Milky Way, and that our origins are not from the Milky Way, but that we actually or originate from the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy, not the Sagittarius Constellation, don't get the two confused, the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy. And the merging is still occurring and happening right now. As a matter of fact, um, you have our galaxy, which is going to end up colliding with uh, and, uh, Andromeda, okay? And we're going to become a merged galaxy again. This is something that happens. This is part of uh, galactic physics. This animation depicts the collision between our Milky Way galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy. Hubble Space Telescope observations indicate that the two galaxies, pulled together by their mutual gravity, will crash together in about 4 billion years from now. Around 6 billion years from now, the two galaxies will merge to form a single galaxy. This video shows the Triangulum Galaxy, which will join in the collision and perhaps later merge with the Andromeda Milky Way Pier, courtesy of NASA, the European Space Agency, and F. Summers. Simulation credit. Columbia University. So as you can see, we have the milkometer is what we're going to become, milkometer. So it's really interesting to understand. But again, remember this. Our solar system that we are in right now with our yellow star and the planets that we have orbiting it don't originate from here. We originate from another uh, galaxy altogether. And what's going to happen in a few billion years, in seven billion years, will be milkometer. And all those stars will be merged with the Milky Way galaxy, bringing in ton, probably millions of other advanced civilizations and so forth. So there's a consistent process of this going on in the universe. Uh, and it's really amazing to me because um, it's really in a, in a kind of a weird way, it's bringing our galactic neighbors to us or us to them and putting us in a, in a position to meet more sentient beings. So there's another text called the Epic of Atreasis, which also talks about uh, these beings. This is another uh, uh, tablet system that's discovered and also located at the British Museum. And it talks about the Apsu, the oldest beings and their progenitors. It talks about Tiamat and, uh, and that later on part of Tiamat will become Earth. It talks about Mumu, the sun steward of its house. And it talks about Marduk, which is also named, named Nibiru. And uh, he talks about that planet as it orbits a brown dwarf star and it collided with Tiamat. Uh, so let me give you a quick summary as to what's happened here. So you have 
uh, you have the planet Tiamat. Now, first you have um, the sun, you have Mercury, Venus, no Earth. Earth didn't exist yet. The fourth planet was Tiamat, okay? Now, this Tiamat planet was uh, about six times larger than Earth. It was full of water and oceans and solid rock. It had moons orbiting it. Two of the famous moons that orbited this uh, planet, former planet, was our moon that we have now and Mars. Mars was a habitable moon, and so was our moon that we have orbiting ab above us right now. They orbited Tiamat. Now, Tiamat, according to the enumeration of the seven tablets of creation, and also according to the Atreasis epic, now it's important that it's mentioned, the same story is mentioned in two different tablets from slightly different time periods. So we know that the story can be, is, co is corroborated. In other words, it's, it's, there's circumstantial evidence that this story is fact. That's, in other words, it's as close to a fact or close to the original story as we can get. Now, so what happens is Tiamat collides or Marduk collides with uh, Tiamat. Now, in the Numi list, you have two versions. The oldest version calls this planet Nibiru that collided with Tiamat. And in the more recent version, when Marduk was under kingship on Earth, he changed the tablet, the name from Nibiru to Marduk or Marduk, however you want to pronounce it. He wanted to be the destroyer. Guy's a crazy person. That planet crashes into Tiamat. Tiamat literally explodes. It breaks into pieces. Major the majority of Tiamat turns into the asteroid belt. That's why you have Mercury, Venus. Right now you have the Earth, uh, Mars. Then you have the Ceres, which is a small planet. Then you have the asteroid belt, okay? The asteroid belt used to be a gigantic planet. That's how it got there. It's an exploded planet. Now, one big chunk of this Tiamat, when it broke apart, it swung away. It swung away with all the water, all the life, all the materials on it for, for, to regenerate, and a, a, a large chunk of metal core. And it swung away, and it reformulated as what we now call the Earth. Earth didn't exist yet until Tiamat blew up. Part of that plant with all that water and life on it, this is where in the Enumilish it says, this, the waters were separated from the waters. That actually made it into a modern-day Bible as if God were separating the waters from the waters. But in true reality, it was a story that was poorly plagiarized, copied from much ancient texts where the, uh, the, the writer was, described, was describing, was talking about the fact that the water and biological material had broken away and separated from uh, Tiamat, and went and reformulated as the Earth with all of its waters and everything else. It recoalesced into this planet. The reason why we have the planet, uh, the continents look like they can interlink like a piece of a puzzle, it's not because of the Pangea theory. It's because initially all land masses were connected and the Earth was smaller. As things uh, change and the planet healed or the new planet uh, you know, healed itself, it expanded and as more water, the cycle water cycle built up and as more of the water began to circulate, the planet pulled apart, the, the hard rock pulled apart and expanded away from each other. You cannot have in planetary physics, I don't care how what model you study, you'll discover that if you put all the land mass on one side, you'll have a pole shift, you won't have stability at all. Uh, and when tectonic plates move, you'll have cataclysms on a consistent basis. You just can't have st a stable enough environment for people to be alive. And according to mainstream, people and animals were alive and using walking across because there was land bridges and everything else. And it was, you can't have all the land mass on one side of the earth. It just didn't happen. That's just, to me, based on real research, that's, that's a fact that I came up with. I could be wrong, but the model, that, the model of, 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 of connected land now uh, with a healing earth now expanding out, that to me makes a lot more sense. But either way, um, earth is a byproduct of an exploded planet. That's why our moon, now gravitationally as it swept, swept away, the moon that was orbiting Tiamat, gravitationally got locked with us and came along with us. The, um, mo the Mars, got slung out into this weird elliptical orbit around our sun. That's why it can be as much as, as close as 40 million miles and as far away as 180 million miles. And when you look at Mars, you see that one side of Mars is charred black 
and the other side is smooth. So you have evidence there that something collapsed or something impacted one side of Mars. And that was the planet Tiamat. When Tiamat exploded, large masses of it hit Mars on one side. It then did what I said would happen to the Earth. It, you have too much landmass on one side, it'll give you a pole shift. So Mars shifted and its equator went from straight this way to an angle, okay, about a 45 degree angle. Um, Mars then, multi millions of years later, it healed and it recoalesced and it, it came back to life again. But for a while, it was literally hell on Mars. And Mars found its own weird orbit around the sun and the rest of the debris, the debris became the asteroid belt. And one giant chunk became this planet named Ceres, C-E-R-E-S, which orbits just outside of Mars. And it has more fresh water on it than Earth. They don't really, really like to tell you about that, but it's a fact. It's in the history books. More fresh water on Ceres than Earth has. Uh, and when we flew by it a few years ago, we saw the lights on. They tried to say maybe it was light crystals and everything else, but why was it still lit up on the side that was facing away from the sun? They didn't want to answer those questions. But anyway, I believe that there's, a lot of, there's a lot of life in this solar system right now, not 20 million light years away, not some exoplanet some hundred million light years away, right above our heads, I believe there's life in this solar system. This is the Atra Aces Epic uh, tablet, which is located in the British Museum. And again, I want to show you everything is factual so that you can go and research it for yourself. In the Mahabharata, again, you start to find out that these beings um, existed. The Mahabharata and these tablets really are, end up talking a lot about the same beings. So the Mahabharata is an ancient Indian epic where the main story evolves around two branches of a family, the Pandavas and the Kauravas, uh, who uh, in the Kurukshetra uh, war a battle for the throne of Hespantura. Interwoven into this narrative are several small stories about people dead or living and philosophical discourses. Krishna Dwapian Vaisa himself, a character in the epic, composed it as in according to tradition, he dictated the verses and Ganesh wrote them down. Ganesh is actually Thoth, T-H-O-T-H, the Atlantean that ruled over the land of Kem, now known as Egypt for 14,000 years. At 100,000 verses, it is, it is the longest epic poem ever written, generally thought to have been composed in the fourth century BCE or earlier. The events in the epic play out in the Indian subcontinent and surrounding areas, and it was first narrated by a student in Vyasa at a snake sacrifice of the great grandson of one of the major characters of the story, including within the Bhagavad Gita. The Mahabharata is one of the most important texts of ancient Indian in the world, okay? So these ancient texts in the Mahabharata, which I have the whole set, I, it's in my library, I will show it to you right here. Um, I have the 10 book set, it's a massive volume. And in there, you have the galactic wars. You have beings getting on spaceships and UFOs and flying to other planets. You have weapons of mass destruction. You actually have planetary-sized weapons. With, in other words, we call them Death Stars in Star Wars. You have, you have Death Stars. Uh, you have all this technology being used in the Mahabharata, which makes it an incredible story to read. It's the longest version. Its longest version consists of over 100,000 Skloa and over 200,000 individual verse lines with each Skloa uh, as a couplet and long prose passages. About 1.8 million words in total, the Mahabharata is roughly 10 times the length of the Iliad and the Odyssey combined, or about four times the length of the Ramayana. Uh, and W.J. Johnson had compared the importance of the Mahabharata to world civilization to that of the Bible and the works of Shakespeare and the works of Homer, uh, the Greek drama, and also even the Quran. So they're saying that this thing is magnificent. The way it's written and the information in it and the story in it is so magnificent. It compares and supersedes a lot of the other ancient texts that are out there. So what do they talk about also in this, this text? They talk about these Vamanas, flying ships, okay? Today we will call them UFOs because we, we wouldn't know exactly what they are. But back then they called them Vimanas, okay? And if you can notice the similarity in the shape to a rocket ship capsule, very, very similar. 
So you have chariots of fire representing UFOs, one of a kind uh, or another. You have spoke wheels, wheels and wheels, gears of time. Uh, you have so many references to these types of UFOs in ancient texts. The wheel of time or alchemy, snakes or human DNA, and a biogenetic experiment set in physical space and linear time. Gods mating with human women to create a human race in their image. You have this in the text. Blue star gods. Blue gods or royal bloodlines descended directly from the gods. You have the mythological, mythical battles of heaven and earth in physical reality versus higher frequency duality and mythical wars between the gods witnessed and depicted by humans since the beginning of time. So you have all kinds of wars. You have multidimensional wars. You have third dimensional wars. You have advanced technology. You have bioengineering. All this is talked about in these ancient texts. You have UFOs. It's incredible. It's an incredible story. The Brahmastra is an astra or celestial weapon created by Lord Brahma. This is what I was talking about earlier, the Brahma weapon. It is sometimes known as the Brahma Astra. Uh, and as described in a number of the Puranas, the Brahma Astra is considered to be the very deadliest of weapons. When a Brahma Astra is discharged, neither a counterattack nor defense of any kind can stop it. In ancient Sanskrit writings, the Brahma Astra was a weapon created by Brahma, along with its more powerful versions like the Brahma Shira Astra and the Brahma Manda Astra. The, Brahmanda, the Brahma Mastra and the Brahma Shira Astra are said to be mythical equivalent of a modern day atomic weapon with nuclear and thermonuclear bombs respectively. So we're talking about some real serious damage that these bombs and these weapons can do. And just to give an example, you have a nuclear weapon, which we have now, nuclears. Um, so when you split the atom, you set up a chain reaction uh, within the bomb, within the warhead, and then you have this, this gigantic explosion. In thermonuclear, which is what they're saying these other more advanced Brahma weapons were, in thermonuclear, you have um, a nuke that is inside of a warhead of another nuke. So it's like 10 times the magnifold, 10 times uh, um, uh, folded uh, the actual magnitude of the explosion, okay? Incredible. So we're talking about Death Star technology. They actually had that, the type of technology that can literally blow up planets. Now, contrary to proper belief, uh, Albert Einstein didn't directly invent the nuclear bomb. A lot of people blame him for inventing nuclear bombs. And that's actually not true. Einstein realized the power of splitting the atom, but other people developed the nuclear bomb. And this is Robert J. Oppenheimer. He says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds, a quote that he took out of the Mahabharata when they did the first nuclear test. In an interview with, about the first test of the atomic bomb, first televised in 1965 as part of a documentary called The Decision to Drop the Bomb, Oppenheimer remarked that upon seeing the test, he thought, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. He was quoting uh, in the 1944 Pramavanda and Isherwood translation of Hindu scripture in the Bhagavad Gita, okay? That's where he got that from. And you're looking at the man that's responsible for one of the very first nuclear or atomic tests. So there are a lot of wars in the Bible and these wars are, you know, literally fought, fought by UFOs. So let's have just a quick look here. Okay, first let me, before we get into that, let me talk about how these people, they, these aliens masqueraded as gods on this planet, sometimes ruling from the UFOs, sometimes ruling from the earth itself, but always wanting to battle each other. In other words, they, these, these, these beings, for whatever reason, were full of jealousy and envy of one another, and they wanted to, always to steal each other's resources and humans uh, and, at any cost. So when you look into the modern day Bible, for example, you find that the book of Deuteronomy is really a book talking about aliens, UFOs, and people being sent out as chattel to fight each other and kill each other so that these advanced beings, these aliens, can get more, more land and more resources. So this is one of the scriptures here in Deuteronomy 13, 13. Kill the entire town if one person worships another god. This is, again, more of the jealousy and envy. You're going to see after I read this, if this is not written by the creator of the universe, that this verse uh, is really talking about a very envious and egotistical being 
that's looking to send people out to do harm to other people. Suppose you're here in one of the towns, the Lord your God is giving you that some worthless rabble among you have led their, follow, their fellow citizens astray by encouraging them to worship foreign gods. In such cases, you must examine the facts carefully. If you find it is true and can prove that such a detestable act has occurred among you, you must attack that town and completely destroy all of its inhabitants as well as the livestock. Then you must pile all the plunder in the middle of the street and burn it. Put the entire town to the torch as a burnt offering to the Lord your God. That town must remain a ruin forever. It may never be rebuilt. Keep one of the plunder that has been set apart for destruction. Then the Lord will turn from his fierce anger and be merciful to you. He will have you compassion and, you, and make you a great nation, just as he solemnly promised your ancestors. The Lord your God will be merciful only if you obey him and keep all his commandments I am giving you today, doing what is pleasing to him. Now, first of all, he use the word him too much, number one. That means they're depicting a male figure, and it has never been proven that God is neither female or male. You're talking about, when you're talking about a God, which I, I believe we're talking about a divine source. I think we're talking about a frequency. I don't think we're talking about a him or a her. In this case, it's a him. And then these evil acts that are being let out here is literally uh, proving that there's jealousy and envy, which shouldn't exist in an all-knowing, all-loving creator. So you're seeing here the beginnings of manipulation by these beings, these aliens masquerading as gods, using humans to go out and do all their dirty work. Kill men, kill women and children. Then I heard the Lord say unto other men, follow him through the city and kill everyone whose forehead is not marked. Show no mercy, have no pity, kill them all, old and young, girls and women, and little children. But do not touch anyone with the mark. Begin your task right here at the temple. So they began killing the 70 leaders. Defile the temple, the Lord commanded. Fill his courtyard with the bodies of those you kill. Go. So they went throughout the city and did as they were told. So again, you see <laughs> these beings, some of them were good, but a lot of them fighting each other in these scriptures were pretty evil. And there's a lot of wars. The Mahabharata is one giant war story. The Bhagavad Gita, one giant war story. The Bible, one giant war story. Uh, a lot of these ancient texts, you're finding a lot of wars going on. That's what you're finding. It's really, um, it's really incredible. Uh, this is another one where they're telling them to, you know, to attack uh, another city. They're always sending people to cities to attack them and kill them and kill the women and children, and everybody else. It's really, it's really sick. It kind of reminds me of where we are today. Right now, today, you join the military uh, because you're trying to get uh, a scholarship or free education in most cases. They send you halfway around the world to kill a family inside of their house, so inside of their hut or their tent or some $5 house that they built out of scrap metal. And in your mind, it's all good because you're following orders and you're just trying to get a free education. So you rationalize it. The same thing happened in ancient times. The same exact system that was back then has been copied in today's modern era, unfortunately. This is one of the oldest towns that's evidence of war ridden, Uruk, okay? This is still out there right now. Mohenjo-daro. Remember what I read in that scripture where it said, um, that town can never be, that, never, that town can never come back to life again. Nobody can ever live there again. This is what you're looking at. You're looking at abandoned cities that have been destroyed. In Mohenjo-daro, you have evidence still there of radiation, higher background levels of radiation than the normal background level, which means we're talking about potential nuclear uh, weapons here in ancient times uh, that were dropped down most likely from space or from some type of UFO. Uh, you have uh, the bones and the people laying in the street, some of them still holding hands, evidence that no animals have scavenged on their bodies, and the surrounding buildings in the area are vitrified. In other words, the heat hit over 3,000 degrees, turning the, turning the stone into glass. Again, more evidence that there's a nuclear blast here at this location, following that same exact scripture uh, that we just read. Here's another uh, image here from Mohenjo-daro. 
Um, this is a body pretty much fused to the staircase here. Okay, this can only happen by intense, intense flash heat. And again, uh, this most likely was a nuclear blast. Even mainstream archaeologists uh, agree that this was most likely a nuclear blast of some sort. They can't explain it, but they agree that it actually happened. So Mohanjan Daro and Harappa in Pakistan gave the first clue to the existence of more than 4,000 years ago of a civilization in the Indus Valley to rival those known in Egypt and Mesopotamia. These cities demonstrated an exceptional level of civic planning and amenities. The houses were furnished with brick built bathrooms and many had toilets. Wastewater from these were led into well-built brick sewers that ran along the center of the streets, covered with bricks and stone slabs. Cisterns and wells finally constructed of wedge-shaped bricks and held public supplies of drinking water. Mohenjo-daro also boasted a great bath on the high mound or the citadel overlooking the residential area of the city and built of layers of carefully fitted bricks, gypsum, and mortar, which water, also waterproof butchermen. Uh, this basin is generally uh, thought to have been used for ritual purification. So we're talking about an advanced people, an advanced civilization, living at a decent level at that era and that time that were completely decimated and destroyed by this weapon, this, this, this weapon, uh, maybe a, one of the Brahma weapons, whatever it was, it was one of those weapons that was told to be unleashed on this city and that it should never rise again. Uh, in the 16th century, you have paintings and illustrations here of a battle scene. These are um, people battling in the sky. So you have the 16th century painting, uh, the battle scene of the Bhagavad Gita during the time of Kurosheta, Aruna also, the hero leader of the Pandava army supported by his personal charioteer, the god Krishna. And uh, you're gonna hear, I see a lot of stories about these, uh, these gods going to battle and they're always going to battle in the sky. And the reason why they're battling in the sky is because in my opinion, they're battling inside of UFOs. They have this UFO, this spike going on above the people's heads, and unfortunately, unleashing uh, weapons of mass destruction as well, okay? Um, so I'm gonna wrap this up with something here. I just wanna go into some of the science about the fact that we're from another galaxy because I didn't get a chance to give you some of the actual information on it. Scientists know we're not from here. Imagine the shock of growing up in a loving family with people you call mom and dad, and then suddenly learning that you are actually adopted. This is the same sense of shock that came as scientists announced that the sun, the moon, and our planet and its siblings were not born into the familiar band of stars known as the Milky Way galaxy, but we actually belong to a strange formation with the unfamiliar name of the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy. Using volumes of data from the two micron all sky survey in two mass infrared mode, uh, a major project to survey the sky in infrared light led by the University of Massachusetts, the astronomers were answering questions that have baffled scientists for decades and proving that our own Milky Way is consuming one of its neighbors in a dramatic display of ongoing galactic cannibalism. And the study published in the Astrophysical Journal is the first to map the full extent of the Sagittarius galaxy and show its visually vivid detail how its debris wraps around and passes through our Milky Way galaxy. And Sagittarius is 10,000 times smaller in the mass of the Milky Way. So it's getting stretched out, torn apart, and gobbled up by the bigger Milky Way. And this is a depiction of the video here that we've got from the David Law and also the University of Virginia. And right when you see that yellow dot there in the arms of the Milky Way is exactly where our solar system is located we were literally dropped into place by this merger of these two galaxies. So we ourselves are the aliens here. Rogue planets exist, and there are literally millions of rogue planets floating around. Wandering in the void, billions of rogue planets without a home. This is Scientific American. And the reason why this is important is we're getting back to talking about the theory of this uh, Marduk or Nibiru planet crashing into Nibiru, uh, crashing into Tiamat. How can that be? Well, if we have all this merging going on of two galaxies and we have planets getting sucked in and planet gravitational, gravitationally pulling planets away from their orbits and then getting worked up into this area or this sector of space, all of a sudden you can create 
you can create a trinary system, a binary star system. You can create rogue planets that now are just roaming through and crashing into things. All these things are now possible, theoretically, um, that we've now discovered uh, that we are, uh, you know, we hail from a different galaxy altogether and we're in an emerging process. What I found interesting was if you tilt the Star Trek logo just a little bit, it matches a NASA image of this planet X or this uh, planet nine orbit around our star. Pretty interesting. Just something, you know, <laughs> I found to be a little interesting. The Dogon tribe talk about these beings coming from space and spaceships and UFOs. Okay, and the Dogon tribe have one of, one of the very earliest recollections of these Anunnaki beings. They call them the Nomo. Okay, and these Nomo literally came here in flying ships, and you can see depicted in one of the images here. They came and they had fish suits on, according to the Nomo. I don't think that they were fish men, but they probably had the capability of swimming in these uh, maybe diving suits and had maybe they built their abode underground, like it says in one of the tablets, or Underwater, I mean, like I said, one of the tablets, or these beings had a special type of a space suit on that, as far as the Dogon tribe could tell or utilize in their vocabulary, reminded them of a fish body or fish scales. Okay, so something to do with that lack of, lack of uh, vocabulary uh, or something that they witnessed or a combination of both led them to say that these were fish people, but they were actually, they had human faces and they had two feet and two hands and they walked and they talked and they taught, taught the Dogon a lot of information. So they obviously were not fish. This is a very short clip we're gonna watch here about the Dogon getting information from space. Dr. Guggenheim has gradually gained the confidence of the Dogon elders and acceptance into the inner circle of secret knowledge. The Dogon believe the universe was born in a vast explosion and as it opened up, everything that we know about and everything that the Dogon know about in the world came pouring out and nothing was left except a shell. This empty shell became the star that they called the Pontolo and that we call Sirius B. In 1950, astronomers confirmed the existence of the Dogon star. At the United States Naval Observatory, Washington, D.C., Chief Astronomer Dr. Irving Lindenblad devoted years to the search for the dark star. The Sirius system is a very interesting challenge observationally because it is a very difficult to observe a star uh, 10 seconds from such a bright object as Sirius A. After the years of effort, Dr. Lindenblad finally succeeded in taking this photograph of Sirius B and its giant companion. The Dogon possess even more startling information about the star they hold sacred. They say that when it gave forth all its energy, it collapsed in upon itself, becoming incredibly dense and so heavy that all the earthly beings combined cannot lift it. The San Fernando Observatory, Silmar, California. Dr. Gary Chapman is an astronomer specializing in the physical characteristics of stars. By splitting the light collected from a distant star into colored bands, its physical characteristics can be analyzed. The Sirius B is fairly normal in the surface layers, but we do rely on the calculations to tell us that the interior is essentially out of nuclear fuel. It's a dead star. We know from modern calculations that it has a very, very high density. It has a density about uh, five million times that of water. And if you were to be on the surface of Sirius B right now, you'd be crushed very, very flat because the surface gravity is about a hundred million times that of the Earth. <laughs> The symbol is explained. The knowledge preserved in rituals through the centuries has been confirmed. Beyond the Dogon knowledge of the dark star, 
the symbols reveal more information about the celestial universe. They correctly place the Earth and our solar system within the Milky Way and state correctly that the massive cluster of stars is far more distant than the planets. The understanding of astronomical movements led the Dogon to investigate the human anatomy. They discovered the circulation of blood in the body long before it was discovered by the English physician William Harvey in the 17th century. These symbols and the knowledge they hold are the legacy of the mysterious pneumos, the messengers from the dark star. Many cultures claim their knowledge was given them by godlike beings descended from the heavens. But the Delgans insist their gods descended from one star in particular, which they're able to identify and describe in detail. Does other evidence exist of this encounter between gods and men? In 1937, French anthropologists shot this rare film of the Dogon. They found the people in a frenzy of preparation for a huge ceremony. The scientists were told the funeral of an important man would soon take place. But all this was an elaborate deception designed to protect their secret knowledge. The anthropologists counted themselves fortunate to have the opportunity to observe the making of ritual masks representing the panoply of Dogon spirits. It would be years before the scientists would understand their true meaning. The giant ritual which the anthropologists witnessed was not a funeral at all. It was the Sigi. Occurring every 60 years, the Sigi is the most important ceremony in Dogon life. The Sigi is an event relating directly to the sacred star. The Sigi marks the completion of an orbit, the time when Earth, the giant Sirius, and the sacred star are directly aligned. The moment when the Dogon and their star are closest. For Western science to determine the orbit of the Dogon star required calculations based on decades of astronomical observations. Minute shifts in the position of the giant Sirius led astronomers to suspect the gravitational influence of an unseen companion. When computer studies of the data were complete, they verified that a small star orbited Sirius every 60 years exactly as the Dogon claimed. Okay, again, more evidence from ancients, handed down verbal history and accounts now also etched in the stone in their caves, depicting and showing that beings came here in UFOs from another star system and actually engaged mankind, brought knowledge and wisdom. Their star actually ran out of fuel where they were located, maybe that's why they came to Earth. They came here because Earth has abundance. WISE is the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer. WISE is going to find hundreds of millions of objects spread over the entire sky. And for us, that's like a treasure map. We think there are about as many grains of sand on this beach as there are stars in the entire universe. So the task of finding rare objects in the universe that we're interested in requires the maps that WISE is going to make. It's a bit like using this metal detector here to try to find gold coins that are buried in all of this sand. WISE consists of a fairly modest sized telescope, about 40 centimeters in diameter, that would sort of fit under your arm. WISE is going to survey the entire sky in four infrared wavelengths over six months. All sky surveys are one of the basic tools that astronomers use to find interesting and unusual objects. It's sort of like the GPS of astronomy. 
One of the most exciting things that you expect to find with an All Sky Survey likewise is the unexpected. We expect surprises, things that we have no idea about today. One of the projects WISE is going to be doing is studying the population of near-Earth objects. These are asteroids and comets whose orbits get close to Earth's orbit. Now this doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to hit the Earth, but we do want to pay some attention to them. With WISE, we'll be able to tell something about how many there are, what their sizes are, and what they're made out of. Whether they're soft and crumbly like this ball of sand, or solid rock like this rock right here. In visible light, an object that's small and shiny reflects the same amount of sunlight as an asteroid that's big and dark. But when we look with an infrared telescope, we're seeing heat that's emitted from more sides of the asteroid, so we get a much better, true measurement of the object's size. And this is important because it allows us to tell whether or not we're dealing with an object that's this big or an object that's this big. The maps that WISE is going to be generating can be used to find all sorts of rare and unusual objects. One of these objects is the most luminous galaxy in the entire universe. But finding it is about like trying to find one particular grain of sand on this entire beach. One of the other rare types of objects that WISE may find is possibly the nearest star to our sun. We think that there's a good chance that our sun actually does have a closer neighbor than we already know about, and it's likely to be a very cool type of star called a brown dwarf. The temperature may be room temperature or even colder, maybe as cold as an iceberg, say. With WISE, we expect the unexpected. We're looking for new surprises and new discoveries. And with this exciting survey, we're going to be finding a treasure trove of discoveries that astronomers are going to mine for decades to come. And before we wrap this up, something very interesting. So that was a long time before they discovered that uh, there was, it was really there. Now you're going to hear from an astronomer on mainstream TV that we have a solar system inside of our solar system. Just like the ancient text said, the Enuma Elish, the seven steps of creation, talking about the fact that there was a, another star orbiting our sun that had planets that crashed into planets in our solar system. Um, in other words, uh, the Marduk planet or the, Tiam or the Nibiru planet, which crashed into Tiamat, for example, obtaining an orbit of 3,600 years, which now, according to mainstream science, is about 4,200 years to orbit around our sun you're gonna hear that he's gonna say, that's where we came from. Listen to this real quick. 2012 VP113, jokingly dubbed Biden, get it? Uh, Corey Powell's editor-at-large for Discover Magazine and Studio. How you doing, Corey? Uh, VP Biden. Right on. There we go. <laughs> Correct on that. Two images show you. This is the arrow obviously pointing to it. But there are three dots on here. One is red, one is green, one is blue. Right. What's significant? So this is, this is the actual discovery image. Basically, t two astronomers were looking, one little patch of sky very, very far away, looking for exactly this kind of thing. Stars don't move. Planets or anything that's like a planet does. Mm -hmm. So this is color-coded. This is what they saw on different nights. They're looking for one thing moving. They color-coded it to, to show that all these stars are staying still. This thing is moving, and the way it's moving... So this is just one... It's one object, color-coded. Is three, Pluto three on this? Nights. Pluto's in a whole different part of the sky. So this is way out there. This is way out there. Well, this is more, is, than, more than twice as far away as Pluto. Unbelievable. Why does this matter, Corey? Well, there are two ways you can look at it. I think you know, I look at it, first of all, as, a, as an exploration question. That there, you know, We know where we are on Earth. We've mapped our planet. Our solar system is still terra incognita. It's full of surprises. This object is something that astronomers said shouldn't even be there. There's a mm. whole other solar system beyond the planets that we know shouldn't even be there. There's a mm. whole other solar system beyond the planets that we know shouldn't even be there. There's a mm. whole other solar system beyond the planets that we know that are full of these things that are sort of planets, sort of comets. Some of them they call dwarf planets. That's what they're calling this one. What we're seeing is 
we're seeing our neighborhood. We're seeing what's around us. And then the second part is we're seeing where we came from. Mm -hmm. It's around us. And then the second part is we're seeing where we came from. Mm -hmm. It's around us. And then the second part is we're seeing where we came from. Mm -hmm. It's around us. And then the second part is we're seeing where we came from. Mm -hmm. Go back to the other image, you guys, and we'll show because we're over here on the left, right? <laughs> it's right. That, so we're, our... we're, we're over here. Okay. There's Pluto, Pluto. Pluto's out here. Yeah. And this thing called Maki Maki is way out here. That's right. That's, so that's another dwarf planet. If you want to find out where VP113 or Biden is located, uh, keep, keep walking about another 30 feet that wow, way. Wow, we can is, see that far. And this is the closest it gets this time. When it, when it really gets cooking, it's 15 times as far away as Pluto. That's incredible. It takes uh, 4,300 years to go around the sun. Uh, it takes uh, 4,300 years to go around the sun. Uh, it takes uh, 4,300 years to go around the sun. Uh, I don't know how you know that, but I trust you. <laughs> what is a dwarf planet? So a dwarf planet, the, the, the fact that you hear weird terms like that is actually scientists saying, there are things out there we don't really understand. It's, it's, a dwarf planet is kind of a catch-all term for something. It's, it's round like a planet. It sort of looks like a planet, but it doesn't orbit in a, in a regular way like all the, all the planets that we but knew would, growing up. Would this be part of our solar system? So it's part of our solar system. Or would it system. be outside? It, it's, a, it's, a whole, it's a whole new zone. It's called, it's called the, they're calling it the inner Oort cloud. You don't, really, really, you don't really need to know that. All you need to know is there really are these two solar systems. There's the solar system with the, with the classical planets, and then there's this whole other zone that we haven't explored. Mm -hmm. And now they're saying because of how this, this new dwarf planet moves, that there may actually be an even bigger planet, uh, something bigger than the Earth. Well, I guess that, that's the point I was going to. You, you don't really need to know that. All you need to know is there really are these two solar systems. There's the solar system with the, with the classical planets, and then there's this whole other zone that we haven't explored. Mm -hmm. And now they're saying because of how this, pla this new dwarf if planet moves, that there may actually be an even bigger planet, uh, something bigger than the Earth. Well, I guess that, that's the point I was going to, because you study this all the time. Is that why it's so significant? Because there's more beyond that? There's more beyond that, and then there's more beyond that. I mean, I think you know, what we're seeing is, okay. you know, if you, if you, if you watch the, the show Cosmos, I, I've been kind mm -hmm. of glued to that. And in the last episode, they were talking about the discovery of comets and the discovery of, of you know, our place in the solar system. We're still learning that. We're still yeah, learning this right are. now. And Thanks it's still... Coming, man. All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, just we're, like you're out of space, <laughs> I'm out of time. Very interesting, everyone. Very interesting. You heard it there, mainstream. It's real. It exists. The massive ancient text. People came here uh, in ships from other star systems. We call them now on Earth. We call them UFOs because we don't, you know, un un unidentified our flying objects. Uh, in ancient times, they were all over the earth in these Vamanas, uh, and they had battles in the sky in these UFOs. These, these, these battles of this Atlantean battle, I think, persisted from Earth to the moon and all the way to Mars in more recent times. When I'm talking recent, I mean maybe just a few hundred thousand years ago or less. And um, that's where the Mars God of War, you know, name kind of title kind of came from. As when you read into these Sumerian tablets, you find that these beings named the Ejiji, who were working class Anunnaki, wanted to come to fight against a war against the, the gods of Earth or the kings of Earth because of the labor work, that they were, the labor force they, they were having to uh, uh, be used to do. They literally were being run like slaves and they had enough. So they decided to um, have a coup and go to battle against the kings of Earth, Enki and Enlil. And a decision was made at that point to, to ease their workload, not go to war, but ease their workload by genetically modifying the existing hominid on this planet, creating Homo sapiens sapien. Uh, but these beings flew back and forth from the moon, from Mars to Earth in ships. As a matter of fact, in the uh, tablets, you read where the, um, the EGG, not only did they fly to Earth to go to battle, but after a, an agreement was met, they decided to, to take women back with them to Mars. So they put women in their ship, and this made it into Genesis 6. The sons of God made it with the daughters of men. They took them back with them. Uh, it's just really amazing stuff. This is all in ancient tablets, and it's as close to the truth as we can possibly get. You know, so don't look uh, for NASA to give you this information about these planets, like this traffic system, which is 40 light years away and has all these potentially habitable planets. I think there's habitable planets right above our heads. I really, really do. And uh, the evidence is in a lot of the, uh, the image data that we've collected and analyzed now at the United Family of Anomaly Hunters. We've cataloged uh, over 50,000 50, anomalies, uh, which look like 
this entire solar system has been inhabited and maybe still is inhabited right now by beings on different moons and planets inside our solar system. Okay, so now I'll open up for questions. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate that. I'll unshare this screen um, and I'll open up for questions if we have any or whatever the next uh, step is. First of all, I want to say thank you, Billy. It was uh, very uh, interesting. Um, a bit, uh, what, what can I say, a bit uh, for me, it, it, it was a bit uh, difficult to follow all your, 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 what you were saying with all those, uh, for my case, weird names <laughs> and you uh, were calling, but uh, but I think I got it, uh, some of it at least. I would have uh, Marcello. Um, he is, uh, I think, yeah, he is on. Hi, Billy. Um, Hello. And, uh, and he speaks a lot more better English than I do. So, okay. <laughs> so yeah. he will ask you the questions that is uh, that has been coming in. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay so, um, yeah, Billy, can you hear me well? Yes, I can. Great. So Christian is asking, what about the connection between Mars and Earth? Because many are talking about that the Martians came here maybe and they settled in Antarctica. And do you know anything about this? Can you talk about it? And many scientists say that Mars had water and maybe life. So yeah, very good question. First of all, Mars is talked about in the ancient tablets in the Atra Aces epic and also in the Enuma Elish two very ancient records and accounts of people living on Mars and coming to Earth and going back and forth. So it appears that there were two civilizations running concurrently, one on Earth and one on Mars at the same exact time. The civilization on Mars was slightly more advanced than the one here on Earth. Uh, and the people on Mars uh, had the benefit of living on an environment that literally had oxygen, that had uh, all the other gases needed to breathe and live, uh, liquid water, salt water and fresh water, uh, greenery, trees, you know, vegetation and animals all existed on Mars and possibly in some small way still do. Mars had another uh, war situation and another global flood. And we see the evidence of this global flood and this war when we analyze the images and we find anomalies. So when we see the anomalies on Mars, it looks like they've been exploded or imploded, like blown up from the inside out or from the outside coming down and blowing everything apart. And then you see what looks like a lot of flooding where things appear to be buried or partially buried in mud. So you see that this there was really something significant going on. Now, when you analyze a lot of the science data coming back from the Martian atmosphere and the soil, it has a weapons-grade xenon signature. And this means we're talking a, another, another nuclear war. <laughs> so you not only do we have evidence of an ancient nuclear war on Earth, we now have evidence of a nuclear war. We don't have the time frame, but we have evidence of one on Mars as well. Did we launch a mission to... Mars to battle them and destroy what they had there from Earth? Did they destroy themselves? That's a very, very good question. That ex isn't exactly or specifically stated anywhere. We can only leave it up to uh, you know, speculation. However, we know that on Earth, they used to call Mars the god of war and that there appeared to be a war of the gods going on where these Olympian gods in some way, shape or form we're having a war of battle against these gods of Mars. So in some weird, strange way, they had affiliated this, uh, this spiritual war. I kind of take it as an actual physical war because I believe that those myths are actually real stories, just using the vocabulary of the time. Uh, so to answer a question, yes, Mars is uh, right now, personally, I believe, still habitable. You may need an acclimation mask. You may need some type, of, some type of oxygen if you're too high up on the surface. But the lower you get, the closer you get to the ground or even underground, it's a more livable atmosphere, at least for a human being, in my opinion, based on the science data coming from NASA directly. The gravitational field uh, that it generates is strong enough to help repel a lot of the radiation from the surface. And 
because of the speed of the planet spinning on its axis, which is almost the same as Earth, it's a 23 hour day on Mars, and the movement around, of Mars around the sun creates something called bow shock, which bends the radiation around the planet, preventing it from getting to the surface. So now you have DNA that can actually survive on the surface of the planet. So I do believe that there's still life there potentially in some way, shape or form, but there, it was a second attack or some type of a major catastrophe that happened on Mars. And not too far ago, I don't think it was that long ago, uh, that has put it in the state that it is right now. Uh, and uh, Enki and Enlil definitely uh, were mentioned uh, in the text talking to people from Mars. So I think that it's real. I think it exists. And there's even one famous cylinder scroll in the British Museum that depicts a human being on Earth and a, or a being on Earth and a being on Mars and using this communications device in the middle to have a communication and discussion. So it's really amazing stuff, depictions of advanced technology in the ancient past. And what was the name of that physicist who discovered using uh, NASA's own data that there was that radio radioactivity in Mars? And could you also say something about Cydonia? Yes, yes, I'll tell you right now. Um, let me give you his exact name. Is it Brandenburg or? I think it was Brandenburg, yeah. I think that's the actual name. Uh, let's see right now, just to make sure it was, let's see here. Yes, Brandenburg, correct. Okay, and what about Cydonia and the face on Mars? And could you say something about that quickly in the pyramids? What's interesting is if you look from space at, uh, at Del Allah on Earth in Arabia, you're gonna see the face on, uh, the face on Mars in Del Allah on Earth. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, it's so massive, you have to see it from space. It's, 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 a, it's a massive, face built into the ground that mimics identically, I'm sorry, dear Allah, D-I-E-R-A-L-L-A-H. It mimics the face on Mars in Cydonia. Now the face on Mars in Cydonia was known about very long ago, obviously, early 70s, we, we knew it was there already. Uh, this is one of the main reasons for the, for, the, uh, for the mission. But the face on Mars, according to the ancient text, is an ancient temple built to the remembrance of, um, what was his name there? His name was, uh, it was one of these Anunnaki's that were sentenced to die there because he had lost a battle against Anu. Anu being en the- uh, Enki? No, it's not Enki. His, na his name is Alalu. That's what it is, Alalu. So Alalu, Alalu was uh, a usurper of the throne. He tried to take over the throne of, uh, of Nibiru and he, he tried to claim that he had some blood right to do so. And when he wasn't initially given it, he tried to take it by force. He even killed one of the kings. He fled to Earth. He discovered the gold and some of the other resources that was needed. He negotiated a deal uh, with the Anunnaki, with his brethren or whatever, his comrades, to save himself of being murdered or, or, or you, know, you know assassinated or whatever you want to call it, that he would help provide the location of these these rare ores that were needed to help save his home planet. So a deal was worked out. That still didn't satisfy him. He wanted to have a battle to take over kingship still. So he tried to go head to head battle with Anu. And uh, in the battle, he cheated. When Anu had him down and beat, he leaped up and bit from the ground. He leaped up and bit off the genitals of Anu and swallowed them. Oh. <laughs> so this is in Sumerian tab tablets. He was then sentenced to death on Mars. He was sent there and a temple was built there to his, um, to his name. And that was a temple or the, uh, I guess not really a temple, but uh, a burial site where, uh, where he was left to die. And he, he was buried there as well. So what's incredible is much later, uh, we analyzed the Cydonia images, you know, and you can see that it appears that there's a city there. You can see pyramids, five-sided pyramids, three-sided pyramids. You can see trailways leading to this ancient city. You can see also that there's these, this mound area in correlation to the face, in correlation to the city. And if you take uh, a researcher discovered this, if you take the ordinance map, which you can download online, of Avebury, UK, 
You take the ordinance map of the area and overlay it onto the Cydonia image from NASA. The mound aligns perfectly with the mound on Earth. The city aligns perfectly with the uh, the city, the, the anomaly there in, in Avebury, UK, artificially built. And also then uh, the face as well. It also aligns. All this aligns with this uh, this mirror copy on Earth in Avebury, UK. There's, that's no coincidence. Uh, so it's really interesting. So this Cydonia area is really now also Cydonia. The name Cydonia is the ancient name for Cairo in Egypt. Okay. okay. So yeah, a lot of correlations there. It's um, the people, the powers that be, they know all about this and they obviously try to keep it suppressed to the best of their ability, but it's very well known. Wow, fascinating. And uh, there's a question from um, Tila. And the question is about the Anunnaki. There's so many different opinions about them when they came to Earth. And what is what is your view on this and what is it based on? And at what stage was humankind at that time, you know, or we were created for them, you know? Good question. Very good question. Great question. So according to the Enuma Elish and the Atra Aces epic, you can time the arrival of the Anunnaki on Earth around 450,000 years ago, roughly, between 400 to 450,000, somewhere in that time frame. And um, now, when you uh, analyze these texts, you realize that they had seen uh, the being here, which was us. They meant it's mentioned one time that they saw people here. Now, those people that they saw were not technologically advanced uh, like we are right now, and they weren't exactly us. They were close to us. They were our cousins. I think that people were already here when the Anunnaki arrived. We were in one of those fallen states. In other words. We had gotten to a point where we, before the Anunnaki arrived in a previous world civilization, like the Mayans say, we live in the, we were in the, we're headed into the fifth world. There have been four worlds before us that we had risen to a higher level before. And if whatever happened in that golden age came to an end and we crashed, they caught us in the state of going back into a bronze age if you're going by the yuga cycle. So we were here. I believe that our ancestors were more spiritually advanced than us. Their heads were bigger. The bodies have been found. Their heads were bigger. Their pineal glands were bigger. They were probably more spiritually attuned. They were probably more in, in um, resonant frequency with nature and the earth itself. Uh, but the Anunnaki didn't even decide at that point to interact or to bug us or anything else. They decided to do the work themselves. So in this enumerated list, you discovered that they labored for almost 200,000 years themselves working on the land, toiling the land, creating this breakaway civilization and taking resources back to their, sending resources back to their home planet. 200,000 years they did this. And at that's which point the Ijiji working class, which felt like they were being treated more like slaves and than, than, than workers and countrymen, decide they want to go to war against Enki and Enlil. So what happens is they say, okay, and Enki says, I got a solution to stop this war. There's an existing being already on this planet. We can add our essence to them. So he's basically saying we're going to genetically modify them and make them into our robotic slaves. And people say, well, why wouldn't they just create a bunch of robots? Well, when you're in a breakaway civilization and you don't have a lot of people here, who's going to build, who's going to man the facility? Who's going to man the, re the, the, the building of these things? Who's going to, you don't have that many people at that point. You know, whoever these beings were that were here already outnumbered them. And the Anunnaki had a limited number of people. And you can't have a mass production factory with three people working in it. You need, you would need hundreds, maybe even thousands of people working to create and build and do technical service and mechanics and everything else. It made more sense to them to genetically modify the existing hominid and turn them into a robot, which they literally didn't create humans, but they genetically modified our cousins therefore creating homo sapien sapien, which is what we are. So it wasn't like they created us from dust. It's more of like a genetic modification. And so one of the Anunnaki women had experimented with uh, other uh, beings that were here, our cousins. They had tried cloning. 
The problem with cloning was there was no reproduction. And they tried other forms that were creating uh, malformed babies, um, taking too long for these beings to grow. And in this one Anunnaki, she said, I'm going to take the baby to turn myself. They took a egg out of a female hominid. They took sperm and other genetic material from an Anunnaki male. They combined it in the laboratory. This is what you call making a zygote in modern day biology. And in vitro, they put it in her womb and she took it to term in seven months, I'm sorry, 10, 10 months, 10 months. And she gave birth to the Adamu, A-D-A-M-U, the first Adamu, which is the, means the first man. And there's a famous cylinder scroll about this in, the, I think it's the Osmoni Museum in England or either the British Museum of her holding up the Adamu and the story of how they created the first Homo sapiens sapien. Uh, not that they made it from scratch, but they took existing genetics and made it happen. And then the reason why you have the story in the Bible of them taking the rib out of Adam and everything else is because they tried to mate this Adamu with the existing hominids that were there and it was didn't work. So they said, okay, so they took some DNA from Adam and they created an Eve and then they made it them and she was able to conceive and have children. So that's the whole process behind that whole thing. Hmm. And in another question concerning the Anunnaki, this is again from Christian. He was wondering, do you think that they're still around or did they leave for good? And I was sort of wondering also, have you, since, this, since you're talking about um, these ancient cultures, do you feel that, have you had any contact, do you think, with any of them? You know how Timothy Good mentioned he had some contact with a few mm -hmm. who he, he thought were like these super aliens or super intelligent humanoid looking aliens or any comments? Yeah, sure. Well, first part of the question is, I believe that they are still here. Uh, when I was getting taught remote viewing by Major Ed Dames, who was the head at one point at one point in time of, of the uh, CIA remote viewing um, campaign, where they were remote view information intel for the U.S. military. He was uh, also known as Major Doom. Yes, also known as Major Doom. And <laughs> uh, the project is known as Project Stargate. And so that was my personal teacher for remote viewing. Um, and... Um, he told me that there's a base in Antarctica, which I knew that there was a gigantic opening there and with all these major um, facilities stacked up around it. You can see them from Google Space and each one has a name of what country each research facility is from. And he says, that's because the beings there are the ones from the ancient texts. They come and go as they please and nobody can stop them. Uh, and there's something going on where there's a collusion going on. They're, in collu they're colluding with these beings in some way, shape, or form, and nobody has been really truly privy to the information. Now, if you remember recently when um, Buzz Aldrin went down there a couple years ago, he witnessed what was going on at Antarctica, and he made a tweet that said, we're dealing with the ultimate evil. And then right. shortly, shortly after that, they made him delete the tweet, but everybody already screenshotted it. And then they rushed him off saying he had to come down with some weird illness. He was sick and he had to, he had to go, you know, but uh, it was too late. He already exposed that something weird is really going on down there. Um, and I believe that their offspring are still here uh, in the form of royalty, in the form of presidents and presidential families and things like that. I believe that uh, they're still here. If you look at the ancient texts and you discover that at the last, at the end of the last pyramid war, Amen Ra left the kingship and the finances to his Ra Kam. Now, K A M translates into shield in more modern times. So, if you really put the two words together, he left everything to the Ra shields. And now you have the Rothschilds, really, who have the $700 trillion family wealth and really control this entire planet from behind the scenes. So, I think that has something to do with it, you know? As far as interacting with these beings, I'll tell you that in 2016, I was out on a sales call taking care of some of my own personal business. I, have, I was already heavily researching and talking about and blogging about the Anunnaki at that time. I wasn't famous on TV yet or nothing like that. I had been on a couple of shows, but nothing really too, too major. I go into this restaurant to get a salad during my lunch break. And this guy, about no, no shorter than seven feet. Now I'm six foot four, so I could tell what seven feet looks like. I've played with basketball players 
my whole life, walks up to me inside of this restaurant out of the blue and says, tell me more about the Anunnaki. And I'm like, whoa. At this time, nobody knows me a lot, you know, by face. My Forbidden Knowledge account didn't even have my face on it yet. People just knew Forbidden Knowledge when it had the Eye of Horus logo. That was it. Um, I wasn't on TV talking about the Anunnaki, things like that. And I just pull up to this place and walk in. This guy walks up to me and tells me this. And that, first of all, that blew me away. It got me a little nervous, too. <laughs> but it happened. And, uh, and he said, come have lunch with me. And I was like, okay. He says, I'm here with my wife. He said, but don't worry. She doesn't speak any English at all. And she sure did. She spoke. I think she was Colombian. She spoke. She had no clue what we were talking about. And after I talked to him a little bit, I told him what I knew. And he says, you're pretty close. You're pretty accurate. Um, he said, and there are beings that genetically modified us. And I was like, us? And he said, yeah, us. And um, he took me out. When I left out of there, I went to his car. He handed me this small manuscript, maybe like no more than 20 pages. And he said, keep this and don't show it to anybody. But in this manuscript, it talked about these beings and, and that they had another uh, level of creation or creator or genetic modification even above them. It was the most bizarre thing, man. It was so strange and so bizarre. It left me shaking a little bit. And that was, uh, that was a few years ago. So I had that experience. That was really incredible. Before that, I had another experience with gray aliens, which was even more scary. And that was in 2010. I was building this major facility called Fort Terra Nova. That's why I had gotten on TV. They found out I was building an underground base, uh, History Channel. And uh, it's completed. It's, it's, a, it's an underground city the size of four Walmarts, three to four Walmarts underground, about 50 feet down. And 360 people can live, with, live in there for one year, completely off the grid. Uh, and it's a $20 million project, huge project, huge. And during this time, I'm mentioning that because I don't know if this has, has anything to do with this visitation, but I, I come home and I'm in my house and uh, it's about 9 p.m. I'm not even close to going to sleep, not being tired. I'm trying to get a couple of sports updates on ESPN and the whole room turns lavender. The TV goes down, shuts off. I thought it was my kids, my boys playing a joke on me. So I look over my left shoulder. That's the room that they're, that side of the house is where they were, split floor plan upstairs. There was nobody there. I'm like, come on, guys, stop it. And I turn around, and when I turn my head, this close to my face, I don't know if you can tell, this close to my face were two gray aliens. And they were standing up, and I was sitting down about this same height. So they were probably maybe no more than three and a half feet or whatever tall. And um, they looked just like you see on the TV, except the eyes, these big almond eyes, I couldn't tell if they were goggles or if they were actually real eyes. I couldn't tell. I couldn't tell if it was a covering or if it was an eye. That was so bizarre. It almost looked like they were fake. They didn't look too real on the face. Mm -hmm. The skin was very pale. The slit for the lips, it's little tiny dots for ears and tiny dots for nose. They didn't talk to me through telepathy or nothing that I can understand. But my brain started shaking in my skull. And um, it was kind of giving me goosebumps now. And um, within, like, I, I could say no more than 10 to 15 seconds, maybe 30 seconds max. It was hard to tell. I was screaming, but nobody could hear me. And the house had everybody in it. Nobody could hear a word I was saying. Even I couldn't hear the scream come out of my mouth. It sounded like it was muted. Hmm. Then they turned around, and they didn't really have a walk like a human being walks. They kind of, they bounced away, like dangled away. I don't know if it was a gravity thing. I don't know what it was. It was bizarre. Like they were on a string and they went through the wall. And then once they went through the wall, the color came back, the TV came back on and everything was back to normal. Then I ran around the house looking for talking to everybody. Nobody heard or saw a thing, not one thing. And I got, I didn't talk about this for a long time because it was, it was one of the main reasons for my divorce. <laughs> I got nothing out of this, but heartache and pain, to be honest with you. Oh. It scared everybody, and uh, it, my, my, my middle son, who's now 24, he's still horrified about the whole situation, and because of that, 
we haven't been in too much on good terms since then. So I lost a lot from this situation. It wasn't, it wasn't a good situation at all, but it happened. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it happened. Hmm. And, you know, um, going back to what you said about the red shields, um, how about information being released in popular culture? This is my own personal question because I remember when seeing the film Jupiter Ascending, hmm. it seemed like a lot was revealed there. And when I saw it in the movie theater, the movie theater was packed. And then I felt like it deliberately got really awful reviews so that pe regular people wouldn't go see it because there's a lot of information dropped in that film about the earth is being owned, we are owned, we're basically like cattle, stuff mm -hmm. like that. Uh, can you please comment about that? Because it sounded a lot, I mean, it was from the brilliance of the Wachowskis, right? right, right. And could you please say, say something about that? Because it seemed really deliberate that they just wanted to keep it away from the masses to hear about Listen, this. I'm so glad you brought up Jupiter Ascending. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> nobody brings this up. I try to tell people, if you want the history of this planet, go watch Jupiter Ascending. It's as close to the truth as you're going to get with sci-fi action. Um, that movie is literally a slap in the face to the reality of what we're living in. Uh, you know, you have the fact that these beings, these advanced beings who we look like them, uh, these hominids, these sentient beings, literally travel throughout the galaxy. They own planets. They own solar systems and they own constellations. They own sectors of galaxies. This is talked about in ancient texts. Like there are people out there that literally own this realm that we're in right now, this planet that we're standing on right now. Uh, and it's hard for an average person to conceive and understand that there's levels to this thing that go way, way, way up. And we as human beings on this planet, given this mundane routine, have an illusion that's so vast, it literally escapes our perception. We literally can't see the battles, the wars, the, 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 um, you know, the manipulations. We can't even tell that we are the cattle. We can't even feel it. We don't even realize that we are the cattle that's being herded and used on a daily basis. Because and, and, yeah, and we have very short lifespans compared to the beings mentioned in the Bible, like Noah was you know, like hundreds of years old right. and so on and so forth. Good point. So before the Tower of Babel incident, we were living for a very long time. And so at the Tower of Babel uh, incident, Enki and Enlil were gone. They went somewhere, maybe to another planet, who knows. Well, Enlil comes back. Now, Enlil is known as Yahweh in the modern day Bible. That's who Enlil is, he's Yahweh. He comes back and he sees human beings building this tower to heaven. This tower was an identical copy of a tower that the Anunnaki owned, that they built themselves. And they were like, he was like, holy crap. These beings literally just in that short period of time that I left, were able to figure this out. So he realized they outnumber us. There's less of us than them. And the longer they live, the smarter they're going to get. And he even says, whatever they set their heart to, they'll achieve it. In other words, he understood that we can literally do whatever we want that they've done and maybe even better. And so he gets infuriated at this because you know, he, he, he warned Enlil, uh, Enki about giving them too much of the essence of the genetics and everything else. And, he, and Enki really gave us a lot. And he decides he's gonna destroy the tower. This is how you know it's not the creator of the universe. He blows the tower up, boom. He then says, my seed shall not abide in man forever. His years shall be 120. That made it into the Bible, that text. Huh. Huh. So he's right there is the evidence of another genetic modification that now for, we already were notified to be a homo sapien. Now we're going to modify you to shorten your lifespan because you live, you're living too long. You're getting too smart. So they, they, they cut the lifespan. How they did it was a modern biologist, modern genealogy, discovered this. It's in, it's in actual printed modern day science books. Chromosome number two. They don't know how it happened, they say, was taken out and fused together in the human body, and a telomere cap was put on each end, and those telomere caps house genetic 
material for replication of DNA in cells. So every time your cells and DNA replicate, which happens on a consistent basis, the telomeres shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink until they run out of this material. When they run out of that material to create new copies, your body starts the death process. And that's, what, that's why we die young. We die at early age. If we were in the most pristine conditions at Harvard University discovered this, with the right food and the right clean atmosphere and everything else, we can live to 120 years. Ironically, modern science, again, backs up these texts. So then at Harvard, they said, you know what? Let's look at these telomeres. So they got mice and they started experimenting with mice, genetically modifying them and then playing with the telomere caps. And they found a way to stop the telomere caps from degrading in mice. And they got the mice to live three times the normal lifespan at the, in the laboratory in Harvard which means if they can do it to mice, you already know what that means, mm -hmm. they can already do it to a human being, thereby restoring our long lifespans, which is why shows like yours and mine and all the other shows we have going on and lectures and workshops are so important for people to understand and watch because we have to awaken so we can take back control of our planet because if we don't take back control of our planet from these elite people with these high level uh, in intelligences, we will eventually be forced to buy our own time. They're going to sell us our own lifespans eventually. That's going to be a commodity. How long mm -hmm. do you want to live? Mm -hmm. You know, you want to live to be 100? It's going to cost you this. You're going to have to do this, this, and this, and this. And also, it can be used as blackmail. It can be used as a way to hold things over people, to get them to do things that you wouldn't want to do. So we have to take back control so that we can get back control of our sciences and get back control of our genetics so that we can then, uh, you know, create a path, a clear path to our own future. And it all has to do with increasing our level of consciousness collectively. That's right. That's where it starts, man. Yeah. Dropping the seeds and watching those trees grow and watching the shade come out. Uh, and it's a process. It takes, it takes time. <laughs> it is a process, but we, have, we can't stop. Well, there is also a morphogenic field thing happening as well. Big time, okay. it seems like. Yeah. There is a morphogenic field and yeah. also cosmic rays coming from the galactic equator that's also modifying our DNA. Yeah, great. Uh, there's another question from Tile. It's about the Anunnaki. They are, so you were saying they arrived here about 450,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. And how does this correlate with the Emerald Tablets, which are dated to about 4,000 BC? Okay, good question. So the Emerald Tablet, there's one Emerald Tablet, singular, and the Emerald Tablets, plural. Uh, there's many books that Thoth had written, well over 80 uh, that he had written and uh, authored himself. And the Emerald Tablet uh, of Hermes or Thoth is located in the Cambridge Library. It was deciphered by, uh, translated by uh, Sir Isaac Newton. Okay. Huh. We also have the Emerald Tablets, plural, which are uh, multiple tablets, which Thoth talks about. Uh, and he claims to have built the Great Pyramid uh, at Giza, and he talks about the last great flood sweeping over the land and clearing up over the land of Kem. And this, um, uh, this writing is estimated to be about 36,000 years old, not, uh, not 4,000. So you have, uh, you have several versions of this tablet that are out there. I wrote a book about it called The Compendium of the Emerald Tablets. Right. In my book, yeah. So in there, I break down, in the very beginning of the book, I break down the fact that there's two versions of this thing. One is a tablet singular, and one is a tablet plural. And then I go into breaking down the tablets and what the meanings are that I was able to extract from them. Uh, but uh, yeah, there's, there's two date ranges. And if you look at the Great Sphinx, if when Thoth says he built the Great Pyramid, and we know in the tablets, the, the, the Sumerian tablets, he was ordered to build a sphinx by his father, Enki, and he was told to put his face on the lion's body. So the reason why the face that's on there now is not the right size for the body is because it was recarved, but it wasn't recarved from a lion. Marduk, his brother, his jealous brother Marduk, also known as Amun-Ra, decided when he took over kingship of the earth, that he would change his brother's face because him and his brother were always fighting and he put his son's face. So that's Thoth's nephew's face now recarved onto the Sphinx. Now, if you look at the alignment of the Great Sphinx 
to the constellation of Leo, uh, of Leo where it was one processional period ago, that's, right. at the, that's an ice age period. But if you go back another processional period, you had an extinction period. If you go back one more procession, you had a perfect time frame to build a sphinx, to give a plateau, and to rebuild life on Earth from the cataclysm. And that means you're talking of an approximate of 36,000 years ago if you go back to processional periods. So it really does align with the animal tablets, plural. Uh, and I really do believe that they're most likely uh, around that age. So you're saying that the pyramids of Giza, because this, was, this pertains to a question earlier from Christian, how old do you think the Giza pyramids really are? So you're saying that most likely they could actually be 36,000 years ago. And they were in a pristine state until that huge earthquake in Cairo a thousand years ago and the marble, uh, the limestone, the white limestone covering of it that was just perfect and it made them so bright, which is stripped off to rebuild Cairo. Right. They took that up after, the, after that and cracked up. They said, you know what? We can use this material. We don't have to go mine it. We don't have to go get it and drag it here from hundreds of miles away. These pyramids, we don't even know what the heck they're capable of doing. Let's just strip this stuff off of here and, re and use it. And they used it, man, and they used it well. Unfortunately, <laughs> they really did use it. Um, and there was a lot of material, you know. So um, they used it, and um, that's what happened. That's well known. But, yeah, so the, the pyramids, in my opinion, are around 36,000 years old or maybe even a little bit older, uh, and the Sphinx as well. So these things have been here for a very long time. When you look at Robert Schock's work on the – deterioration from weathering of the Sphinx. Right. He says, man, this has got to be minimum 13,000, maybe 26,000. So we're getting up there in those time frames where we're starting to realize like, oh, wow, this, this potentially could be 36,000 plus years old, this, these, 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 these relics. And, you know, John Anthony West, he took some tours around Egypt a lot, you know, he was such an expert about it. And he said he had some engineers and architects on his tours and he would point out things in the construction of the pyramids and they were just flabbergasted. They couldn't figure out how that was actually built. Yeah. And um, I got to go to Egypt about four or five years ago when there were all these terrorist attacks going on. And so my wife and I, we just had Egypt all to ourselves. It was yeah. crazy. And we got to meditate in the King's chamber for an hour and it was a deep consciousness. Yeah. I felt like the whole, I had a very deep awakening in that. And it felt like the whole pyramid was a consciousness machine. Mm -hmm. Incredible. I believe yeah. that. Yeah. I really do believe that. Yeah, you think you, I mean, you're blessed to be able to do that. I spent some, a lot of time there in 2014. And I was able to have a meditation in the Holy of Holies at the temple of, um, I think it was Karnak or Dendera, one of the two. But inside the Great Pyramid, I spent a lot of time in the King's Chamber. Uh, and man, listen, you can feel, you can feel the energy in there. There's a weird energy. When I had my camera going from my cell phone, the waves started coming across my screen. So sometimes electromagnetics were interfering with the, the camera in the phone. Uh, it's just really an amazing place. That the Great Pyramid is a multifunctional stone computer. It's capable of portal generation. It's capable of uh, power generation, wireless power generation. Uh, it's capable of communications. Those giant shafts that point at Aldebaran and Orion and Sirius, yeah. that's not a mistake. Nope. Those are pointing there because the pyramid was built on top of an aquifer. That aquifer now has since dried up as the Nile moved away from that area mm -hmm. due to the dams and everything else they built. But that aquifer would create physiostatic electricity. It would then go into the queen's chamber. It would, I think the queen's chamber to me was an extraction um, filter for extracting hydrogen from the water. And so it would shoot this through the shafts, this hydrogen frequency. Now, when you research the, um, uh, the most widely used anticipated frequency of advanced civilizations for communications among stars, they say they would use a frequency of hydrogen. This is all by Michio Kaku and, you know, uh, you know, Seth Shawshank. I mean, all these people who are doing this for a living every single day. Uh, and now, ironically, I believe that the, the Queen's Chamber extracted hydrogen from the, from the water. And I believe that's what shot through the shaft. Now, why would they do that? Because I believe that the shafts were sending information, communications 
to those star systems. I think they were in communication through using the Great Pyramid as a communications device. So it did so many different things. Uh, it's really an amazing tool. If you analyze the Great Pyramid by the, uh, by the size of each one of the stones, you can calculate the distance from the Earth to the moon, the distance from yep. the Earth to the sun, the speed, around of, the speed of the Earth around the sun, the speed of the sun around the galactic equator. You can calculate the tropical year, the sidereal year. Um, all this can be calculated just by analyzing the stones of the Great Pyramid. And it's also a one by 432 scale of the Earth as well. Right. Uh, just to quickly mention for you, Billy, um, there was an author, a British author named Paul Brunton. He wrote a book called The Search and Secret India in 1934. The next book that he wrote was The Search and Secret Egypt. And he wrote about his experience of spending a whole night in the king's chamber. And medit he was a deep meditator as well. I Check that out. It'll blow you away. But um, there's, another, there's another question from Attila. She wanted to clarify. She was asking also about the Sumerian tablets and the mention of the Anunnaki's and how, what will be the timeline, timeline for the Sumerian culture? And she was saying that the Emerald Tablet was originally, officially dated to 800 AD. So why do you think that it's older than that? The Emerald Tablet is the one that's in the uh, Cambridge Library right now. Okay. Uh, and so that em the Emerald Tablet is newer than the Emerald Tablets, plural. You have two sets. One is one singular, one tablet, and the other one is a string of tablets. Right. Together. And so the, the other ones are claimed to have been much older. Uh, we're talking, first of all, Thoth says the land of Kem. His mission was to go to the land of Kem. They had waited for a very long time for the waters to reside, the waters from the rushing fountains. And so there was a global flood. And when the waters finally resided and he saw an ancient temple coming up out of the mud, his dad sent him out there to go re-kickstart civilization in the land of Kem. So the land of Kem, we know, is an ancient name for Egypt before it became Egypt. So we're talking about thousands of years before the dynastic era even began. So we're talking literally thousands and thousands of years ago. That's the clue right there for the Emerald Tablets, plural. Um, and then uh, the other part of the question was, uh, what was it again you said? Um, about the, the dating, the dating of the Sumerian, Sumerian culture. Oh, Sumerian terms, culture. Yeah. Okay, yeah. In so, terms of the Anunnaki and all that. Yeah, experts like to say 6,000 years as a round term. This is where a lot of devout Christians only believe that the earth is 6,000 years old because the Bible took it from, um, you know, the dating of Sumerian tablets and Sumerian tablets that existed in the time frame that existed there, and they became part of the belief system that everything was created only 6,000 years ago, but that's not, just not true. But the, the, the Enuma Elish and the seven tablets of creation give us a hint to how ancient this civilization really, really is. Now, the Sumerians themselves, their civilization, according to the Enuma Elish, doesn't really get kickstarted until about 200,000 years ago. Ironically, when you look at uh, modern biology and they're talking about Homo sapiens sapiens showing up on the scene, they say about 200,000 years ago. The Atra Esesepic and the Enuma Elish uh, lead us to believe we're talking close to, you know, a half million years ago is when these beings arrived here. The Enuma Elish is going back millions of years in terms of the information. How did they get this information? How did they know about Tiamat? and Mars orbiting it, and the, our moon orbiting it, and the collision that created the asteroid belt and all this stuff, that information is super ancient. We're talking about, you know, millennia, 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 super millennia, maybe Googles of millennia. I don't even know how they could figure this out. But that information was obviously then handed down um, generation to generation in some way, shape, or form. Somebody said, you know, I need to record this. Uh, I need to record this on stone for future generations. So they did it. So uh, thankfully they did that, but the Enuma Elish give the clues and the Atra Asis epic give the clues to the dating of the age of the, the time that the Anunnaki arrived here. Also, the Egyptian Book of the Dead alludes to it when they talk about the Natiru, the Neder actually arriving on Earth. These Neder right. are both Ra, Osiris, uh, Ninhersag, and these other characters 
that were here, uh, you know, depicted in hieroglyphs all over Egypt, modern day Egypt right now. Uh, and so those texts really can give you uh, the time frames, not the specific exact date, but the time frame. And then when they talk about the amount of shards that they orbit, they, because they talk about shards, and shards we know are 3,600 years. So they talk about these shards, um, and these shards, if you, every time they mention how many shards it took to do this and how many shards it took to do that, you just multiply that by 3,600. Now all of a sudden you're finding out, man, this is a long period of time. When you look at the Sumerian Kings list, which is going to give you a lot more dating capability, the Sumerian Kings list is located in the Osmolian Osh Museum in Oxford, England. Okay, and when you read the Sumerian Kings list, uh, you're going to find out that they were there were kings here ruling over the earth, uh, pre antediluvial kings ruling over the earth, and these antediluvial kings were ruling. Some of them for 28,800 years, uh, one for 36,000 years, another one ruled for 43,200 years. Uh, you know, these time frames are immense. Five cities with eight kings ruled for 385,200 years. We're talking about big time frames. This is recorded on tablets that are sitting on a major display in the Ashmole Museum, central attraction. We have the dating. We know how long ago they got here. Um, after the Great Flood is where the animal tablets of Thoth pick up, plural, the tablets with an S, where he says the waters begin to reside, and then he begins to go re-engage mankind. And at that point, a decision is made to not just have these Anunnaki gods or kings ruling, but to have a liaison, a pharaoh, that would be the liaison between humans and them, because uh, that's the new planet they went forward with. Uh, and so that means they want to have a half human and half Anunnaki person to fill that role, to have the bloodline there, to be the go-between. And that's exactly what they did. Wow. Hey, Billy, thank you very much. That was a fantastic uh, introduction. And it just reminds me of what Albert Einstein said, the ancients knew something which we seem to have forgotten. And... Yeah, we need to wrap it up right now. But just a, just a, if you could answer just one little thing in like a, in like two sentences, what is your reaction when you meet smart people and they say to you, "Oh yeah, the pyramids—they're just tombs." <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, the ego part of me wants to just rip them up and throw them out, but I don't do that. What I typically tell them is, "Look, I understand that you believe that they may be tombs, but based on my years and years of research and actually going there in person." I come to the realization that they're most likely advanced stone computers built by advanced beings. You could take it how you want it, but I don't think that they were tombs for dead bodies. I think that they were much more than that and that we have a lot to learn from what our ancestors left behind. That's it, that's it. Well, thank you very much, Billy. That was really, really interesting. Thank you so much. And it's so, so wonderful. You've got such a passion for it and such integrity and, and just going to all those sites and doing actual field research and stuff. So thank you very much for, for this. And thanks for surviving the hurricane. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. And oh, being able God. to transmit so, you know, with no interruptions. Yeah. Yes, I was worried. Like, hopefully this thing does work. I said, this needs to work. Before we started, I said, this needs to stay connected. Don't disconnect. Yeah. Not that, you know, I just believe that if you, the power of thought and, and, and vocalization could have an effect on reality. Absolutely. We are so much more powerful than than what we've been um, programmed to believe through the mass media. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much, Billy. That was beautiful. And, and yeah, thanks. Have a wonderful rest of your life. And yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much. Namaste. All right. Namaste. Bye-bye.